How do you want to live your life? Do you find yourself not doing the things that you want to do and then doing the things that you don't want to do? Well, if that's the case, you are not alone. You can join with the thousands, if not millions of people that echo that verse that indeed Paul himself said, I find myself doing the things that I don't want to do and not doing the things that I do because he recognises within his own life that there are things in his life that he wish he could do better, that he wants to change the way that he lives, but often finds it a battle. So today we are going to look at how we might live life differently. And there are two halves to my talk today. And we're going to go straight in because I don't want it to be uh, too long. I'm aware that often watching things on a screen can become exhausting. But I'm hoping that today will be something transformational that you can apply to your life today that will radically change the way that you live. Now, Jesus gives us a framework in the passage that Luke read for us today, a framework of how to live life. And whether we like it or not, believe it or not, this book gives us everything that we need to live a good life. In fact, Jesus himself thought so. That's why he talked about it in such a way. But I want to ask today, do you struggle with the Bible? Now, I want to help you today get to grips with this text that we use every single week. Churches throughout the world still build their lives upon it. And I'm going to say today that there are some things that we can do to engage with this book differently. That's the first half of my talk. And the second half of my talk is a case study of how that looks. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus valued this book. And when we face challenges with scripture, we then often, don't we, abandon it. It's too hard. It's too complicated. I don't like the things that it seems to say. So I'm going to abandon it altogether. But Jesus says, I have not come to abandon it, to abolish it. I have come to fulfill it. That word fulfill means to complete. That all things in this book have been found in completion in Jesus. He's not replaced it as some of us might think. He's not abolished it. I think many of us have got to the point where we can take Jesus. uh, But we've become essentially red letter Christians. In other words, there are some Bibles where where only the words of Jesus are written in red. And what we've done is we've become only worried about the things in red and we kind of don't know what to do with the rest. We don't really like what Paul has to say. We don't really like most of the Old Testament. But Jesus says that if you're going to take me seriously, you need to take scripture seriously. Do not think, he says, do not think. That I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but I've come to fulfill them. He affirms the law and the prophets. What does that mean for us? It's everything in our Old Testament, pretty much. The law was the first five books of the Bible called the Torah and the prophets of the prophets, both major and minor. Sad life if you are the minor prophets. You're just as important in our book, but you've got the name minor prophet for the rest of eternity. Jesus affirms our Old Testament, in other words. So the question is then how we read it. Now, there is a theologian who I like a lot called Scott McKnight. And Scott McKnight is uh, Chicago based. Uh, a little bit of bias there for me, who, who, those of you who know me quite well. Uh, but he's Chicago based theologian. And this is what he says. There are a few ways to read the Bible. Maybe some of these will resonate with you. The first is that we read it formationally. We read it to receive from God. I suspect this is many of us tuning in today. We see it as a spiritual, intuitive, devotional, relational exercise. The second way we can read scripture is informationally. We read it to know what it really said. Those of us who like to read things informationally might have our Greek or Hebrew out to one side, maybe Aramaic if we're feeling really daring. And we try and read the Bible informationally. Let's see what it really says. Third way of reading it is canonically. What that means is the Bible is called the canon. 
uh, because it's the canon of scripture, the collective of the, the 66 books. And we listen to scripture, read scripture canonically. We listen with the rest of the Bible in mind. Uh, the fourth way of looking at it is historically. What did the passage mean then when it was written 2000, 3000 years ago? And finally, and the final way of reading it uh, possibly is called socio-pragmatically. In other words, we read it to foster and, and uh, invest in our own theological, practical, ideological, social agenda. In other words, if we've got a particular bee in our bonnet about something, if we've got something that we are passionate about, we read it with that lens. All five of these ways are perfectly valid ways to read scripture. In fact, a wise thing to do would be to read them together formationally, informationally, canonically, historically, and socio-pragmatically. All of those are important, but this is the critical piece. Unless we read the Bible with the lens of Jesus, we will read it wrong. Unless we read the whole of Bible with the, the Bible with the lens of Jesus, we will read it wrong. It's not okay to simply be red letter Christians who only read the words of Jesus because really that contradicts itself. Jesus himself in the passage that Luke read for us today acknowledges that we need to build our lives on scripture. And the scripture that he knew, of course, was the Old Testament. Now, just because it might sound easier, we often like to default to the words of Jesus. But in this series on the, on the Sermon on the Mount that we're doing, I want to challenge you to really hear the words of Jesus. And I'll challenge you that maybe it's not so cosy or warm or fuzzy that you might have originally thought. He says he has come to fulfill, that all of Scripture is fulfilled in the person of Jesus, including all of the Old Testament. It's brought to completion in him. All that the Old Testament was pointing to is in him. He hasn't come to contradict, to abolish, to throw out. He's come to fulfill, bring to completion. And therefore, when scripture talks about eternity, it means that all of human history is fulfilled in Jesus. Past, present and future brought to completion. His words bring to completion the entirety of human existence. What this means that is that Jesus cannot be a mascot, a side character, an add-on, a mentor, or even a life coach. He's not there for us to go, that was wise, Jesus, and then move on. He is the Logos, as John talks about in his first chapter. Through him, all things were made. We read this at Christmas. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And that means eternally everything is incomplete in Jesus. So what that means is everything that we see of his life, death and resurrection. And therefore his teaching as well. Gives us everything that we need has been revealed in Jesus for our lives. And so he says, for truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So lesson one, Jesus is the central story of all of scripture. Lesson two, following Jesus means following him and through him we follow the Old Testament, the Torah. Jesus says, verse 19, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying those who follow the teachings of scripture, including the Old Testament, will be called great in the kingdom. And those who don't, won't. Lesson number three. This means everything changes. If scripture is brought to completion in Jesus, then everything changes. God's word is made flesh. The Old Testament is revealed in Jesus and is completed in him. That means when we read our scripture, we do so with the lens of Jesus and we have to accept scripture as it is. So lesson four that Jesus has for us is the righteousness of, our righteousness has to be better, if you like, than the most religious people. He talks about the Pharisees and says uh, that they, uh, we have to be better, more righteous than they are. 
And what he's saying is it has to go beyond legalism. His whole Sermon on the Mount teaches us how to live, but it's more than just a set of rules. It's about a change of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. Jesus is telling people how to live and ethics are more than just surface behaviours. We live in a post-truth, moral, relativistic world, which means what I'm about to say is a taboo because Jesus really does have things to say about the way that we live, that there is a firm and fixed morality. And never mind the fact that in our culture, we decide our own truth, our morals. And because we've lost anything objective, because there's not one truth, but multiple truths, and we can define our own truth, how dare anybody tell me how to live? And what that means is because we've lost any sense of objective truth of how to live, we've splintered into individual atomized in, uh, members of society. And so we've lost any sense of how that how our behavior might affect other people. And so the only thing we have remaining is the law of our land, which differs, of course, from country to country. We're taught to think that anything that is legal is therefore moral, not necessarily. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it is the kingdom of God at work. Sometimes there's overlap, but doesn't mean that is the case. And you don't have to look too far back in history to see that. That which is moral, the way in which we live our lives, is that which the story of God is revealed through scripture. Morality, how we live, is not about being condemned by rules, but about rules that give perimeters to our life that give us freedom and life. That's why scripture as we're reading it even today has formed the basis of European culture for centuries. Nobody has bettered the rules of scripture, the laws or the words that Jesus has uh, taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. Even the Christian philosophers Kant and Hegel tried to shape a moral philosophy and do it without Christ because they thought that they thought it was more palatable without Jesus. We have to accept that when Jesus talks about this passage, I have not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. We have to accept that the teaching of the Torah through the lens of Jesus could shape my life. Later on, uh, Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. When we read scripture through the lens of Jesus, we should expect it to shape our lives and help us to live out that, that commandment. Essentially, the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus dis uh, teaches it in all these different episodic moments, is a way of Jesus saying, this is how you're to live. You know, I said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind and do it with all your strength and love your neighbour too. This is how you do it. The Sermon on the Mount is like a manual, if you like, to how we do that. Helping us love God and helping us love our neighbour, but love not defined by our own definition of what it feels good, but defined by Jesus. And that's why he says, love the Lord your God with all your dot, dot, dot strength, because it takes all of our resources, all our will, all our desire and all our actions. If you want life to look different, but the teaching of scripture, put the teaching of scripture through the lens of Jesus into practice. So you might be thinking, well, how on earth do I do that? Well, thankfully, Jesus gives us six case studies. And this is the second half of the talk today. He roots his scripture. He roots how he reads scripture in through real life. That's his hermeneutic. He reads scripture and places it slap bang into the middle of real life and, and essentially these six case studies that we'll be looking at over the next few weeks has this same format yes but you have heard it said but I say to you yes but we like to assume because Jesus comes across as kind of a uh, a kind of cool hippie style like just hang out with me kind of guy that he assumes all the, that we he throws out all the difficult bits of scripture no what Jesus is doing is challenging the interpretations of scripture that people have gotten used to. 
asking two questions. What is the intent of God behind the passage? And then how are we meant to live? So remember, these are not laws. You can live your life however you want to live. We're under grace. But if you want to engage in a life that looks different, this is an invitation. The Sermon on the Mount is an invitation. Join in with a fulfilled life, not defined by our world, not defined by riches, but a really, truly fulfilled life. So the first case study that we have is murder and anger. Now, I'm sure I'm not talking to many people for whom murder has been an issue. But don't worry, everyone's included in this one. Jesus says, you have heard it said to people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anybody who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. In the ancient world, murder was punishable by death itself. And Jesus, later on in the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll come to later, talks about retaliation. But what Jesus is talking about here in the Old Testament that he's referring to uh, in Genesis and, and uh, Deuteronomy and Numbers and so on, it's defined as intentional murder. It's not talking about warfare. It's talking about when you deliberately go out and kill, take someone's life. An intentional murder was frowned upon, to say the least, because it was defiling the image of God. Remember, every human being that you encounter has been made in the image of God, which is critical to the greatest commandment. To love God and to love our neighbour is also to love um one another because they are because one another have been made in the image of God everyone has the image of God in them but this doesn't begin and end with murder Jesus recognizes that when we are angry yes it can in extreme situations lead to murder but anger itself takes away something from the image of God in others and so Jesus goes deeper it's anger Anger that might lead to murder, but anger, that's the beginnings. And he's not exaggerating to make a point. He's saying anger dehumanizes people. Anger wounds people. And that doesn't even include when we actively act on it. It's just the emotion itself can wound other people. If I discover that somebody is angry at me, it wounds me. It takes something away from me. If I'm angry at somebody else, I'm causing uh, the hurt of somebody else. Not only that, anger can be addictive. Anger can be addictive. There's an adrenaline that kicks into gear when we're angry, when we cut up in traffic or whatever it is. And there's this kind of, although we feel riled up, there's something quite powerful about it. Anger feeds anger. How many people get angry at somebody else and they're angry in return and so flip, flap, flip, flap, flip, flap, and it keeps on going. Anger doesn't even need to be acted on to take hold of us. So much energy is spent keeping anger alive in us. Anger, I definitely have moments of anger. Sometimes it feels justified. Sometimes when I reflect back, it really wasn't. Anger, though, is a feeling. And often, more often than not, is a spontaneous one that arises in a particular moment or conversation And in some ways, there's nothing wrong with the feeling, but what we do with it when it arises. I think of anger a bit like a fuel tank. It's like sitting there in the guts of me. It just sits there. I'm not necessarily aware of it, but all it takes is a spark and it lights the whole thing up. And that spark is usually when it hits a wound in me and probably a wound in my ego, my pride, my sense of self, my rights, my control, my, my, all about me. One thing is true. Anger poisons all of our relationships. If you think about all of human history, just for a moment, how much pain could have been avoided if, we, if anger hadn't been present? Think about your own life for a minute. How much pain could have been avoided by you or the pain that you caused others if anger hadn't been part of the picture? Dallas Willard, who writes the most brilliant book on the Sermon on the Mount, I recommend it to you, called The Divine Conspiracy. He says to cut the root of anger is to wither the tree of human evil. 
In addition, anger and contempt go hand in hand. But contempt in the eyes of Jesus is seen as worse. He says, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Raka is an Aramaic word, one of the few Aramaic words uh, that, uh, that we have here in scripture, untranslated. It's thought to be, uh, the reason it's thought, thought to be a word of contempt, that means contempt, is, is because of the sound that it makes and that kind of gathering of the saliva at the back of your throat. Raka, it's that kind of anger in it. And it means contempt. It means you have contempt for somebody else. And in doing so, you exclude them from your life. Jesus says they should be in the highest court in the land. But then even worse, he says, anybody who says fool is condemned to judgment. The religious connotation there is not just a fool as you're an idiot. It's somebody who is in willful rebellion against God. There is soul damage done when you call someone a fool. It's eternal and it dehumanizes people. And the consequence is judgment and the fire of hell or Gehenna in the uh, original language, which is a valley known as a place of God's judgment. Jesus, remember, is speaking here. We might think for a moment, lead ourselves to thinking that this is just the Old Testament rearing its head and we don't really like it. Jesus is speaking here. It's serious stuff. So what do we do? It'd be easy to simplify and say anger's not okay for followers of Jesus. But there are times when anger seems to be okay. God seems to be angry at times. Jesus calls people blind fools. And in Matthew 23 and other places, he uh, he cleanses the temple. He turns over the tables and says, this is not okay. As a result, people say, oh, he's just exaggerating in this passage just to make a point. But Jesus is upping the ante for those of us who are followers of Jesus. In the light of the kingdom of God, in the now and the not yet, there will be moments when anger is necessary. But as the kingdom in the end times comes about, anger will not be a part of our world. So as we're not there yet, we are to avoid sinful anger. But righteous, loving anger at injustice can be a kingdom act. But remember, our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities. So there is a call to us today to resist anger, but also to persist in reconciliation. The antidote to anger is reconciliation. We like to think of reconciliation on a global scale. But Jesus here is talking about your friends, your family, your neighbours. Therefore, if you're offering a gift at the altar there and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift. First, go and be reconciled to them. And then come come and offer your gift. It is about our closest relationships. And interestingly, challengingly, the reconciliation begins with the person who feels wronged. If you have something against your mum, your sister, your friend, the Jesus mandate is to go to them and tell them. Not to talk about them to other people, but to tell them. These are the words of Jesus. Reconciliation is not easy, but it is necessary. Now, some of us may wish that Jesus left the Old Testament as it is. Those of us who like the red letters might want to think again about how easy Jesus's words really are. But remember, all things are brought to completion in Jesus. All things, the whole of scripture and the whole of life in its fullness, And so to live a complete life, life in its fullness, is to resist anger and to persist in reconciliation. There's so much more we could say, particularly in the area of reconciliation. And what I'm hoping to do is uh, to send a couple of resources your way, if you would like to, uh, to explore that more. May we pray. Holy Spirit, would you come and would you enable us to see scripture through your lens, to come under the authority of your words so that life may be different. And for those of us for whom anger and reconciliation is challenging, 
would you enable us, equip us, encourage us to step into the things you have for us. Amen.